So I'd like to introduce Travis Maddox, lead developer at AMC, and Adam Anderson, an application developer on the team. And they're going to talk to us about uh, AMC and their experience with Orchard. Thank you guys very much for coming. No problem. All right, so we're apparently the only ones who didn't get the memo about the, the slideshow template, so <laughs> apologize. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, quick intros. So I'm Travis Maddox. I'm the lead application developer over the external facing team for AMC Theaters, uh, which basically controls the website, uh, up until recently, basically also the entire API platform that we expose to affiliates for the various web APIs and RESTful endpoints so people can consume our showtime, movie information, etc. cetera. Uh, I've been at AMC for seven years. Uh, I've been the lead over the web team for three. Uh, before uh, the web team, I was doing mainly internal application stuff, your typical enterprise stuff, so architecture, stuff like that, all that fun stuff, biz talk, everything out of SharePoint, Silverlight, everything that you would typically associate with the word enterprise. And uh, I'm Adam Anderson. I uh, started working at AMC about three years ago. One of the first members of the Yeah, so I'm Adam Anderson, um, application developer on the website team. Been with AMC for about three years. Uh, one of the first members of the of the web team. Um, been doing uh, web development work for about 12 years professionally. So that's who we are. Who are we as a company? So we're AMC Theaters, which is basically the second largest uh, movie exhibitor in the continental United States. We have I believe 347 theaters spread across uh, various places. Uh, our business serves over 200 million guests in and out of our doors to see movies annually. Uh, about 90% of our business still is mainly pure retail. People go to the theater, buy their tickets, experience it that way. But we are a large online growing industry in terms of we're up to about 10, 10 to 12% of our business is now online sales of our tickets. Uh, so I actually was going to show it like this, but I think it's going to be better if I actually just demo the website. So let me go out of here. Yep. Maybe if I move it. Do that. Well, we were going to do that, but maybe I'll go back to the slides. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody who's a Mac user. We're <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're Windows on Mac, so it's even more confusing. Here we go. So this is basically the homepage for amctheaters.com. Um, the bulk of our content is actually supplied by our API layer, uh, which is basically exposes that we kind of trickle up through Orchard uh, into various widgets. So you can see like the show times here on the left. This is actually all powered by 
custom module, which if we go over here to the admin, kind of see if we go to widgets, you can see we have a ton of them. If I go down, find the home page poster grid, so you can see this is kind of what's controlling all those. So we kind of have some custom stuff around it consumes our API layer, gives a preview for our content admins around things such as Here's the top movies that are going to display. Typically, due, our, due to our marketing department, they basically override all the suggested values we give them for the various movies they want to promote, which you can kind of see around here. Um, so it has three various tabs, which is why you see three different sections. But So that's like one of the major widgets that we have there. The site is mainly powered by location. So obviously, to give you show times, we know where you are. So you basically do quick searches. This is all actually hitting Bing APIs. To return us geo coordinates, and on the back end, your APIs, we're then locating the theaters. Uh, that then trickles down to this little module over here, which is also another widget that's reused across various layers across the site um, that has various settings. So, if we want to spin up an IMAX page that only displays a widget with only the IMAX movies, we can just create a layer, throw the widget on it, they can promote it, and just say, only give me IMAX movies. Our site is 100% responsive, so you see if I go down, we're now in the mobile view. We can come out of there. All right. So then you can go into things such as like the theater pages, where we have things such as slideshows that show various, this is one of the main theaters in Kansas City, various views, et cetera, of the experience. Um, we also built kind of a little custom media management spa like application for the business to use that we call theater media, which is a little module on the side. So if I go and then look for studio, you should be able to see the associated images, which is then all managed through Orchard on the back end. So you can see all the little interior images. This was all developed before the 1.7 media module, so you might see a lot of rewriting at the same wheel here. So, uh, so yeah, you can see we, we, we did some stuff like image preview, cropping, when you post the images, optimizes them. Um, did that mainly for the bloggers because we also have a blog and they like uploading two megabyte TIFF images. <laughs> so, so yeah, so you can go down. This, so this page obviously is responsive as well. So we just do things like killing off the media. Uh, then if I go in, then I can kind of do the same thing going into like a movie page. So this is a page for Spider-Man. Uh, I know they went over the Azure stuff yesterday. But so we have trailers hosted on a CDN that we actually use a company called Brightco to actually do all our renditions of trailers. And much like we did for theater media, we have another admin area kind of in the back that we call title media, which title and movie are basically the same word in our industry. So you can see actually Amazing, Amazing Spider-Man 2 is up on top. So you can see here's where they went and uploaded a hero image, which is displaying on a different page, a slider, as well as the trailer we just watched which they simply did through an admin interface. And what this actually does is they'd go in, they'd find whatever image, preferably the most high definition one they can find, they'll upload it. It throws it to basically our admin controller server, then a background task will pick it up so that they don't have to sit there and wait for it to upload to our CDN. And then so it's eventually consistent. It can take between 15 and 30 minutes for it to actually propagate across the CDN. Then the task actually picks it up, checks that it's propagated, and pulls all the metadata, info, metadata information around that then kind of links it up. So then it will eventually start displaying. Again, this page also responsive. Uh, we also, as I mentioned, have a team of bloggers that are based out of Hollywood that basically blog movie news. They have a YouTube channel. And they actually just use, we have some customization to it, mainly around like fields and extensions to do things such as this hero slider. This is actually a widget that's just pulling up basically a media extension on the blog post, basically is looking for the top blog post and pulling in that hero image into a slider. Uh, which, yeah, that's just the typical blog, so it's really exciting in terms of what that looks like. Uh, so yeah, if you go to a post, it's just a, a typical blog view where we have our connect with us, you can share everywhere. They embed some YouTube videos. Uh, we do not use the, the built-in commenting system because the bloggers wanted to use Discuss. So we basically just have the Discuss widget basically injected and thrown onto the bottom of every blog post. 
uh, and they just sniff that out based on the URI of the blog. Um, we also have a loyalty program that has over 3 million members. Uh, it's called AMC Stubs. I am a member of it. <laughs> so we can log in and kind of see some of the neat stuff. You might actually see, let's see, I won't mention it unless it happens. Yeah, so there's a bug. Uh, but this is actually supposed to take me to my Stubs book, but we have some weird networking thing happening where it's like caching 301 redirects or something. Uh, but this should log in, this should go to, this is my AMC Stubs book. I actually don't have on my work account too many Stubs. So this is basically all the movies I've seen since I've been an AMC Stubs member. Uh, you can actually make your account like public or private. So I can actually go over and look at Adam's account, who's actually public, and he has way more Stubs than me. Uh, and you can see he watches a lot of children's movies. <laughs> kind of weird, because he doesn't have kids. He actually has kids, but. <laughs> so, uh, but you can see it's just like your typical slider. If you're actually on a tablet, it's pretty cool, because it actually does the Netflix. You can actually drag and slide it. Do that. Uh, I forget what Jake and Corey just let me use for that. But that's also responsive. We're actually looking at kind of changing this, because two stubs doesn't really provide you much value on a link. Uh, I can then go in and look at things like this is my stubs dashboard, which is just simply rewards I've earned, transaction history, et cetera. Uh, we can also do things such as we have the entire profile area, which is basically where all your information is, date of birth. We are an e-commerce site, so we have like a wallet you can manage, which is, so I have a stored credit card. You can also store gift cards, which you reload and reuse, as well as I can go and view my virtual card for AMC Stubs, which then I could just scan at the theater if I wanted to pull up the website that. So now we'll go in. I also have favorite theaters on my account, so I can just go to AMC Studio 30. So I mentioned we are an e-commerce site, so I'll go ahead and just kind of end the demo real fast. Go and just buy like an adult ticket for Blended, new Adam Sandler movie. So you can see, so this actually kind of switches to a different template and theme in terms of we're taking you out of your Chrome because we don't want people to get distracted out of their purchase. Once you're in the purchase funnel, which a lot of people probably see in places like Amazon, get them through the purchase funnel. Like, the AMC's not even clickable, so I don't want you to go back, I want you to buy something. <laughs> so, uh, no shiny objects. Yeah, no shiny objects is a good way. So I select the seat. That seat was actually rendered up through the point of sale system at the theater, and we're throwing it out as an SVG, which means we did have some browser compatibility things. Mainly, we finally bit the bullet, which is, you try to go to the site on IE8, it'll just say, you cannot use IE8, these <laughs> objects. Uh, so yeah, we can check out. Now, so this is interesting, uh, which if anybody runs a major e-commerce or just company that sells, you have to deal with something called PCI, which is basically Visa yelling at you about credit card information. So you don't want something such as the Orchard code base in the scope of PCI, because the last thing you want is them, the PCI auditors reviewing your entire CMS code base. So the payment area, which is the only place you can actually enter credit card information, you can see the URI change. That's actually just a straight NBC5 site. It's as lean as possible so that they can just kind of roll through the audit process, but that would still allow us to actually deploy things through the CMS rapidly without having to go through an auditor every single time. So I'll go ahead and actually buy the ticket. So now it's talking to APIs, doing things like communicating with the point of sale, buying it. You can see, so now I have the ticket. I actually go down, I'm not on a phone. If I was on a phone, it would detect I'm on a device and give me a QR code I could scan. So I could actually just bring the ticket to the theater. So that's kind of a quick overview of the application. Uh, Adam switches back over to us. You can actually show that if you want. of me doing this screenshot so you can see, but I think it was a lot better to actually just show it. <laughs> so, uh, all right, so the inception, so which is kind of how AMC got here, which is AMC used to, which is what a lot of major brands do. Um, I know there's a lot of companies that uh, are in the room that support major brands like us, but we used to actually kind of outsource basically all the marketing, all the website. Uh, and so we had some actual bad problems with some other very mainstream CMSs to where 
they could not support the performance or the scale needed for us to necessitate a major e-commerce site where we actually had issues about four years ago where we couldn't even, they launched a new site on a new commercial CMS that costed a lot of money and it couldn't even have 50 users without a completely bombing server, completely bombing everything. Uh, so. So we eventually kind of bit the bullet, decided to move it internal. And I'd actually heard about Orchard for the first time. I'm not sure if it was Sebastian that was there, but it was actually in Dev Connections in like 2009 or 2010. Somebody was presenting Orchard. It was like point one. They were presenting it as a framework. They didn't even mention the word CMS. They were like trying to avoid it with a passion. Uh, but so we learned about Orchard in 2009. When we took it over, we did a typical process of we reviewed about five CMSs couple of the other mainstream.net open source ones. Some of the commercial ones actually did an RFP. We landed on Orchard and been very successful with it ever since. It was actually nice because the developers chose the CMS finally, which is a big step for us to allow the, develop, the developers said this is what we want to work with versus letting somebody else dictate it and then, oh no, you get a deal with it. You know, you know. So, so that was a big thing. So now we'll just do a high level overview of kind of the technologies we do. And the second half is actually going to be Adam doing some deep dives into some the various iterations, some challenges we've had along our way, upgrading through various versions, as well as throwing up some code. So this is just the typical breakdown if you've seen how I kind of split everything up. But we do basically, we are currently running Orchard 1.8 as of like two weeks ago or a week ago. Uh, we were on 1.6 before that. So obviously we're on MVC 5, CSS 3. We do use a CSS template, but we use the HTML5 boilerplate template. We're not using Bootstrap. Uh, we do use less, and we do primarily use Knockout for all our uh, form bindings and all the stuff you saw in like the theater media management. Tell me, that's all driven by Knockout. Uh, we do use have various authentication methods: Facebook, basic Facebook, Twitter. Uh, some utilities we use heavily are <coughs> Elma. For we, we actually have a log for NetAppender that throws everything's in Elma. Uh, if you don't use Elma, basically catches all our unhandled exceptions. A lot of people have mentioned it. We use New Relic as well. If you don't use New Relic, it's worth it. It is by far one of the best health monitoring tools you can implement, especially on a high scale site. So we do have obviously the multiple tiers in the service layer, which Adam will get more into, um, because a lot of our catalog information flows from a web API layer that is using hypermedia APIs. We're on SQL Server 2008. We do CI and CD through, through team build, obviously with MS build scripts, uh, typical things everyone else uses. Uh, so we are self-hosted. We have an entire basically data center and hosting department. Um, so we are not in the cloud per se. We are on a scalable virtualized VMware infrastructure. Um, and they're pretty beefy servers. We're currently running, on a standard day, we run about eight servers that are it's about two per IBM blade, but they're about four cores with 16 gigabytes of RAM running on solid state drives. Uh, we scale up. We've been at one point up as high as 24. Uh, and they're typically running about 20% CPU, but we have had to where we, we get a lot of memory. We don't have a distributed cache, so the servers with the output cache are caching everything kind of themselves. Uh, we do want to get to a distributed cache, but we're not quite there. We have a very large SQL farm that kind of obviously powers everything. And we have an entire internal API server and setup. So this is what, whenever I have new developers come in, they're always like shocked because, you know, a lot of people just come in and think, oh, well, we're just gonna, we're just gonna, you know, work on CMS and make a website, some simple pages and simple content. They don't realize all the things that go into simply connecting amcfears.com and getting it running. So this is what we call a flight diagram, which it kind of just shows Everything our website interacts with to do something as simple as selling a ticket at a theater, to showing Showtime, to connecting with our loyalty partners for AMC stubs, connecting with people, Facebook, et cetera, Akamai for images and posters on the CDN. And all of that eventually comes into the middle and is presented through Orchard for consumption by the guest. Our team architecture, we are a very lean team. There's actually only four developers who directly on a daily basis are actually developing on AMC theaters. We have an entire 
team of data architects that do, and we have an entire API platform team now. But the people who are actually day-to-day -day working in the AMC Theater solution in Orchard is, with Adam being one of the senior people and basically three more people than him, and then me as the team lead, I'm not obviously 100% rubber meets the road in terms of code. Uh, we do, so we do a, a lean software development process. This is actually the board as of yesterday. So you can see we have some things in planning on some video widgets. It's all prioritized by the business. I could go into obviously like the SDLC stuff all day. That's like an entire other presentation. But we release every Wednesday. Uh, every code check-in is done through CI, auto-deployed the servers. Things go through QA every Tuesday. So today, just happened a few hours ago, that week's deployment is thrown up into a staging environment and we do automated load and regression testing every week uh, to make sure that we don't inject something that basically just makes the scale completely go down. So we, we don't want it to ever be our fault. Uh, so that happens every week. Assuming that goes well, we deploy every Wednesday. So all those cards on the right actually got load tested this morning. It went well. I think it was like 2 million HTTP requests in an hour or something like that, which is actually pretty light. Uh, in terms of knowing what we do. So from traffic perspective, our major markets are Chicago, New York, and California. I think California has the most theaters. Uh, but here's kind of a breakdown is where it comes. The dark of the blue, the more traffic that happens. This is the past 30 days. So we get about 30 million page views in the span of about 30 days. 8 million-ish unique users uh, with sessions also basically being users, about 11.5 million. Our growth since we've launched Orchard has been consistently 30 to 35% year over year. So since we've launched Orchard, we keep running into the milestones of traffic is going up 30 to 40% every single year. So we're constantly, constantly refactoring, constantly looking at performance. It's, it's the number one thing we actually care about outside, so that nobody wants to go to the site, not be able to buy a ticket because a server pegged at memory or something like that. Sales volume, since we launched e-commerce, so this is the past three days. We've done about, and this is obviously all sold through Orchard and everyone sees it, about $10 million in sales in the past 30 days just through the website. It's not average ticket, average sale is about $29, which is normally people are buying about four to six tickets is our kind of our wheelhouse. Performance, application, so we average about, so this is on Sunday, we had 17.5 million HTTP requests to the server, which breaks down to about 12 to 15,000 HTTP requests a minute. Those are hitting, those are basically funneled obviously through our application servers. So all those requests are being handled and going through Orchard. So if anyone doesn't think it can handle it, it can handle it. So, um, so there's some application for So our response time is actually sitting about 300 milliseconds that's pretty good, so HTTP request comes in. Under, you obviously want that as close to one millisecond as possible, but we have a lot of stuff on our website. There's a lot of HTTP requests that have to happen to kind of serve everything, get everything up, a lot of JavaScript, so that's acceptable to us. Nothing's really ever acceptable, but for now it's acceptable. Database performance. So this is actually interesting because I'd initially created this slide with 1.6, then we launched 1.8, and I actually thought it would be kind of cool to show the massive amounts of SQL performance we've had since simply launching 1.8. So our database performance was typically, with 1.6, we were doing about 51,000 SQL queries a minute to the Orchard database. Since we launched over to 1.8, and this is with no really underlying changes, this is just an upgrade, now that's down to about 21,000 SQL queries a minute. So. Can I give it to my manager? Go for it. I get you, yeah. I will send you the slide. But yeah, <laughs> performance is great. So you can actually see the breakdown of the call. This is another new relic thing, by the way. So uh, actually, some of those calls ignore the is log for net. So we'll just ignore that. But uh, so you can actually see, like on the previous one, it was like 45%. We're obviously just the getting the content. That's actually gone up simply because other calls went away. Obviously, in 1.8, our response time was sitting at like 22 milliseconds per SQL query on 1.6. Now it's sitting about five milliseconds. So we're doing about 17 to 20,000 SQL queries-ish a minute, and that's just a regular day. That's not even what I'd consider peak. We obviously go way up if it's like Christmas Day or something like that. But, and now they're five milliseconds. So that's a pretty good response time. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Adam to kind of deep dive into some various stuff we've done to kind of get where we are. 
So um, we started uh, this process back in 2011 um, and initially launched our first orchard site um, in early 2012. Um, we were running on uh, Orchard 1.2 uh, for that initial launch. Um, it was not a responsive design at the time. Basically, the main goal of this was a feature replacement for uh, the existing um, website's feature set. Um, so I'll take you through some of the, uh, the, the challenges that we had when we were first um, designing uh, what we were going to do um, for this initial launch. Um, and uh, kind of the solutions we came up with to deal with uh, those issues. Um, the first one uh, was how we have our data architected within AMC. Um, so and I think this is fairly typical of a, of a larger um, enterprise. The company has a master data model, big set of SQL servers. Um, that's where the majority of the applications within the enterprise are sourcing their data, and it's kind of the central source of truth for the whole organization. And there's detail process that moves that data over to an application-specific database that denormalizes the data. And then we expose that. At the time of this launch, we were using uh, WCF um, with the REST starter kit uh, for the web services. Um, since then, we've upgraded to Web API and their uh, hypermedia web services using uh, JSON plus HAL. Um, so, that being our, uh, the, those web services and that application database acts as our source of truth for the, the website itself um, as far as our catalog data goes. And when I say catalog, I'm talking about uh, movies, theaters, showtimes, stuff like that. Um, we didn't feel like it was a good idea to duplicate this data again and move it into Orchard. Um, because of the way the ETLs happen, they're batches, and you get a delay, and, and um, the, the update from your master data record. You know, we didn't want to add an additional delay to, to, to batch that in. The solution we came up with in order to consume these services but still have uh, uh, pages, um, content items, based off of uh, these theaters and movies and um, showtime information looks something like this. Um, basically, the top one's kind of optional depending on the data we were exposing, um, but we're going to create a route and a custom constraint. Um, the custom controller looks a lot like the, the item controller that's, uh, that's in um, Orchard. Basically, that controller is going to get data from the services, create a new content part or content item on the fly, and then we're going to fill in that data um, and then let Orchard handle the composition. That was one of the things that we felt like was really important. The, the, the power is in um, its ability to, to compose parts and um, content items and render shapes. And we wanted to give that ability to uh, our admin users to be able to go in and add additional content on the theater page or customize a specific thing um, here and there, but, but source the main data from, from these services. Um, in a little bit more detail, this is what the, the process looks like. So um, for, say, uh, theater data, we developed a, a custom route constraint um, that uh, is going to talk to uh, our service layer, verify the existence of said piece of data based on the URL route that's, that's coming in from the, the browser. Um, and it's going to cache that. Um, and then it actually caches the entire data because it's getting back the full theater information for at a minimum the duration of the request so we don't have to round trip, uh, turn right back around. If it exists, we're going to, um, it's going to return true and the controller action gets invoked. We're going to go get the data if we haven't have it cached. Um, and at that point, we're going to just ask the content manager for a new content type by name. So in the theater's case, it's theater content. Um, and we've defined all the, the, the parts that we need and it's basically like uh, a page but uh, we've got some additional parts that we're going to fill in our theater data with. Um, so the content type definition manager is going to compose the um, parts and hand them back to us. So within the controller, we just take our service data and apply it directly to the parts that matter um, to us, and then hand that back off to Orchard to build the display. Um, and uh, works, uh, works really well. Um, so this is so this is our in the e-commerce area. Uh, we've got uh, this is the order review controller. This is kind of a uh, more specific example of that 
that code. Um, so that call up at the top, um, we're getting the service information and then you can see we're uh, newing up a content item. Uh, applying that uh, uh, view model that, that we built from the service data uh, to the parts that uh, implement an interface um, and then just ask an orchard to, to, to render uh, like it knows how to do. So, and the ones in yellow, this is an example from a movie page, it's the same process. The ones in yellow are the ones that are coming from service data. Um, and the rest of the stuff is stuff from, from your standard um, zones and layouts and widgets. And um, based on the layer rules or uh, whatever, the you know an admin can come in and um, add additional ads and whatever to a movie, a specific movie page or all movie pages or, or whatever. Um, so the second challenge we dealt with, um, the, the first challenge we, uh, uh, with the service data, we actually implemented before we deployed. Um, some of the performance challenges we discovered after we actually launched. Um, the, the server performance, um, talking about uh, basically the, the amount of time that, that it take, took to render a page and how much resources uh, from a server perspective um, the site was using. And so we launched and it was uh, not good immediately. Um, and then the, the, the second issue was um, dealing with um, mobile, mobile devices and the amount of bandwidth. We were serving up a rich desktop app um, to, to these mobile devices that are uh, resource constrained and bandwidth constrained. Um, and that wasn't an optimal experience for a guest. So we were trying to figure out how to solve that problem. Um, and then um, initially when we launched, uh, we were dealing with a lot of individual HTTP requests to fulfill the page. And so we wanted to to reduce that and figure out an optimum way to, to minimize that. So from a server performance perspective, there was really one solution we deployed. <laughs> cache everything. We immediately turned on the, it was contrib cache, output cache module at the time. Um, and that solved um, our immediate needs there. It did have some uh, side effects though. Um, because of that, we couldn't uh, render user specific HTML to the guest because everybody that comes to the homepage is getting the same results from the output cache, um, which means stuff like our Showtimes widget, which is displaying the specific theater that you've selected, can't be served from the server. So the, the solution for that and, and all these uh, other places where we had issues like that was basically we're gonna round trip, as soon as we get to the page, we're gonna look at some cookie information to figure out what stuff to show you, go make an Ajax call until that data end um, after the fact. From, from a mobile perspective, um, our solution there was, and we rolled this out, I don't know, a couple of months after initial launch, um, was we actually included the, uh, the Contrib mobile module that's out there, um, does user agent detection, spun up a new theme, and was serving up a, a, a mobile specific theme for mobile devices with a way to transition back and forth between, between the two. That, was, that theme was based off of uh, jQuery mobile at the time. Um, from, uh, from the browser request perspective, uh, our solution, we, we originally tried to use the, the Combinator module that was out on, um, that's out in the gallery. Um, and at the time, we were having issues with it based on the way that our environments are structured. So we've got dev, test, um, stage, and we just do a kind of an X copy role between the environments. Um, and then we're running on multiple servers. So we were having issues with um, those, uh, those resource files. Oh, that's fine. Um, that uh, were being rendered by that being incorrect um, for our use case. So we ended up building our own custom resource bundler um, that handles being in a multi multiple environment, multi-server um, setup. And uh, we, I think Travis mentioned, we don't have a distributed cache, still don't. Um, we're pushing for that. Um, so we're using uh, we're SQL Server as our distributed cache. We just write a, a record, um, one server renders, uh, the, the bundle um, information, and then all the other servers can pick it up from there. Um, but uh, that's, that's working well for us. It's one of the areas where it's kind of really specific to our use case and the code's not polished in a, in a way that it makes sense for us to, to, to put it out there for, for general consumption, but uh, that's something we'd like to do at some point in the future. Um, so we moved on and uh, launched 
uh, AMC, Theater, AMC Theaters 3.0, um, which was the, the primary uh, goal of, of this feature set was a complete site redesign. So this was our first initial launch of a completely responsive um, theme, which meant that all of the mobile work that we had done in the previous release went away. Um, so, hey, it's uh, job security, right? Um, so, um, this one was built on top of uh, Orchard 1.4, um, and yeah, we launched this one, what, about a year uh, after our, uh, our 2.0 launch. We were iterating the entire time, adding smaller features um, between, between then. And um, we actually worked with a company called uh, Happy Cog, I don't know if anybody's heard of them, um, that uh, uh, to, did the responsive des designs. Uh, we use their, their templates and, and uh, stuff. That's why it's not based off of Bootstrap, which that talk earlier was great. Um, so, yeah, there's not a whole lot uh, to go into here. Um, the fully responsive. And then uh, Travis demoed the, the media management piece that we did um, for, and that was part of this launch. It launched a couple of months after. Um, ultimately, the, the media library stuff that's out there now um, kind of supersedes what uh, we've done with regards to that. And uh, at some point, we'd like to take our code and move it over to, to work on top of the media library platform. Um, so I didn't really want to highlight any of the details of that. Um, but anyway, so um, AMC uh, 4.0 was probably one of the more uh, challenging to date um, based on the, the feature set. So the, the primary goal of this iteration was uh, inclusion of our entire uh, loyalty program in the, um, in the AMC Theaters site. We used to have a, a, a site, it was amcstubs.com. You could go log into the site. You could see the same features that Travis showed earlier um, with regards to being able to see your Stubbs book and see your, uh, your dashboard and that kind of information. Um, and it would seem like those are relatively simple features to add. Um, but uh, the, the big caveat there is that we're now allowing guests to log in to the website. And I don't know if you're familiar with the details of how the output cache works, but when you log into the website, when you're logged in, it doesn't cache anymore. It's just doing the full rendering, which has some uh, fairly significant performance implications for guests that are logged in. And we really didn't have a good feel for how many of our users were going to be logged in. Um, the site traffic on AMC Stubbs was significantly smaller than AMC Theaters, but it was also a separate website. Um, and so, uh, that was that was a, a pretty interesting challenge. Um, that that top one is is that uh, was a major performance challenge that we had to deal with. Um, all of them uh, that were challenging in this one were, were directly re related to performance. So, um, as a uh, implication of the 3.0 launch, um, now that we are not serving um, a mobile specific theme, we started dealing with the performance issues um, mobile devices during this launch as well. Um, one of the things that, uh, that, that came out of, of, of this development effort, which I thought was uh, kind of interesting, was um, we kind of focused on what to measure um, as far as performance went. Um, you know, Travis highlighted uh, the server response time, time to first byte, um, and, and those numbers look good. Uh, prior to uh, being able to log in, our time to first byte was actually well below 100 milliseconds. Um, we typically we'd serve up a cache page and it was you know 50, 60 milliseconds um, time to first byte. But you got um, you're loading all the CSS and JavaScript, and then once the, the the DOM's ready, we're making AJAX calls and filling in all this stuff. And so the time that it took to actually get to I can click on a show time and do something was maybe five or six seconds. Um, and on a mobile device where it takes longer to load that initial content, it takes longer to make that AJAX call, those times were really, really bad. Um, and so we wanted to deal with that. But yeah, the, the, the metric that, that, that we decided to, to go with, rather than time to first byte or page load time, which can be skewed by including Facebook and various other things, was basically the user's perceived performance. Um, how fast can I interact with the thing that's important on the site? 
the blog posts that are way down the page, we don't really care. The, like on the home page, the primary thing, the most important thing that we show is that Showtime's widget. How fast can you um, deal with that? So we actually modified our load testing script um, to validate, uh, I can click on a Showtime and interact with it um, as our metric for how fast those pages were going. And to make sure that as we um, add code, we don't break that, because um, that's kind of important <coughs> to our business. Um, our solution uh, to the whole thing was to don't do everything we did before. Um, <laughs> basically, uh, don't cache everything and uh, cache a little bit more strategic. We actually implemented a, a custom module to do uh, substitution caching. Uh, donut caching, donut hole caching, I'm not sure um, which one uh, it actually counts as. Basically, we re-render a portion of the output cache per user based on some uh, information. This allowed us to render user-specific content without re-rendering the whole um, thing. It also had a, a really nice side benefit for that perceived performance issue, which was we can inline user-specific JSON data into the page so that we can, you don't have to make that callback to get Showtime's information. Um, we can load it immediately and it comes directly from the server. Um, yeah, so I wanted to take you through this in detail, um, kind of the, the, the process that our uh, substitution cache goes through. I thought it was fairly interesting. Um, so in the initial uncached request, um, we're gonna go through the standard rendering pipeline using, it's built on top of the, the output cache, so it's just doing its normal thing. Um, but we're listening each time a shape is displayed. Um, and if the shape has a dynamic uh, substitution context set on it, we're gonna remember that. Um, and we're actually gonna wrap that shape. Um, and that wrapping is really, really important for us. So we just add a wrapper to it that's a substitution wrapper. Um, which uh, ultimately renders uh, some, and they're just uh, HTML comments, but they render it in the, the actual output cache. Um, and we're gonna save that substitution context that, that, we're, that we were listening for um, as the, it's going through the render process. Um, and so that's all actually stored back with the cached item and the output cache. Um, so the, on the second go around, um, we're coming in, we're gonna fulfill this request from, uh, from a cache. Um, we let output cache pull its stuff in and do its thing. Um, if we have substitution contests, we're gonna, we're gonna run it through uh, a process. We're gonna go find those tokens again um, and uh, basically re-render uh, the shape uh, that, that uh, we have, we know we have some information about it in the output cache based on the, the tokens that were there. Um, we can use that to match that, that uh, context and re-render the shape. Um, we just replace that in the output cache and then send that back through to the users. Um, so, oh, yeah. The, I wanted to show some code examples because ultimately we planned on having this available now to the community at large. Um, but uh, I'm gonna have to issue IOU for that. That's uh, coming soon, so I would look for that in the next couple of weeks. It'll be uh, available on uh, AMC Theater's uh, GitHub account, just GitHub, AMC Theater. But uh, yeah, so this is about the, the, uh, the, the rendering process. Actually, most of the heavy lifting is done by a driver renderer and these substitution drivers. Um, it's what contains the context. And, injects it into the shapes, and um, the, the, the larger renderer is just firing off events so that we could hook into them. Um, we haven't really implemented any other options as far as um, uh, re-rendering uh, shapes other than just doing it via driver right now. But this is about the simplest driver that does uh, the substitution uh, caching. This is an example of the code. Um, and really the only thing that's different um, is that we need, it's gonna render one shape and we need to know what the name of it is so we can go find it um, and build that context up. Um, this is a little bit more complex example. One of the side benefits uh, of, of, the, of the setup is that uh, we don't just have to fully re-render a shape on each and every request. Um, we can provide some caching information um, for that individual uh, context. So. For example, um, our account navigation widget that's up at the top of the website where you can log in. Um, when you're logged in, it's gonna show user-specific information and when, um, when you're not logged in, it's gonna be the same for, for everybody. And so uh, we just provide a cache key that's 
dependent on what state you're in. So if you're anonymous, you're going to get uh, the same shape as everybody else. And if you're logged in, we're going to cache it based on um, the, your username. And then we don't need to re-render it each time, but it's independent um, of, the, of the main output cache, which is just stored by URL. Um, and this one actually is going to emit multiple shapes um, that we can replace wherever they go um, into the layout. So, yep. And so this is kind of an example of what uh, what that was. So the gray area is the stuff we're not going to touch coming out of the uh, output cache, and um, and then the, the areas that are more clear stuff that we re-render. Um, so we're going to re-render the show times. The cache key for that one is built based on. Um, Movies, if you have a pre-selected movie, it's kind of the, the widget settings that we use. Um, and then your context, which is the theater and date that you have uh, selected. Um, and then the, the navigation area up at the top is, like I said, based on whether you're anonymous or, or your specific username. So, yep. And then our last launch was just uh, just beginning of this year. Um, and... Uh, it's run, it was running on Orchard 1.6. We just launched, again, um, an upgrade to 1.8, but there wasn't any significant feature changes um, to that one. Uh, the, big, uh, the big thing with this was, was our initial online ticketing launch. Um, we're using the same basic strategies as far as composition and using um, Orchard to do that and, and, and talking with services to spin up content items and stuff um, for this. Um, yeah, and that's going well. We went uh, uh, circuit-wide in May. For, for all of our theaters and um, everything's looking positive there. So yeah, up next, we just launched 1.8. Um, our next big upgrade is to move all of our services to be fully uh, async and use uh, all the stuff that's in uh, 1.8 as far as 4.5 and, um, and that. And then we expect that after that, we've pretty much solved all of AMC's needs and we can all retire. <laughs> That's all I got. Any questions? Uh, if you're letting a general public log in, are, are you creating a user record in the database for every person? So, yeah, and I didn't actually talk about that in detail. One of the, um, uh, one of the things that we rolled out for 4.0 was um, a set of um, uh, services, web services for authentication and loyalty. So we did some customization to the users and roles so that the general public is actually authenticating against uh, our authentication services, um, but that we can match up that user um, to a record in the database for admin users um, so we can still handle the roles and permissions in the same way that, that Orchard handles roles and permissions in the admin at large. So you map each user into one of the one of a set of defined accounts and then they or not they, exactly. Um, we actually so for each admin user we have a uh, an admin record that links the service account um, with the admin user and the rest of the uh, the users uh, at large that aren't admin users were not um, hit in a database okay. uh, for and that was just for performance reasons so we didn't have to uh, okay. query Thank for you. each one. Um, the, the planning board that you showed for the daily uh, work of developers, is that software driven or is that uh, in-house application? Oh, that is LeanKit. LeanKit, uh, okay. Which is WWW LeanKit. Okay, thank uh, you. It's probably the best centralized game and software if you use a methodology. Sounds it's, good. It's cheap, too. Hi. Um, what's the name of the CMS you, which was costing a fortune and you? The first one? Yeah. yeah. It was Ectron. Ectron. Um, why not WordPress? Sorry, what? Why not WordPress? Why not WordPress? <laughs> so That's actually funny. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> because our, our marketing department actually was really pushing for WordPress. Okay. And we were basically like, we're not doing PHP. <laughs> so Just we were like, what we were doing? We're, we're a very heavy Microsoft-driven company. We have .NET developers. I would, half the company would have just retired. Okay. And if, if, <laughs> so. if there was an Orchard, you would have been to, to WordPress? 
No, no. we were never going to do that. <laughs> the, so the ones they, we were they may have hired separate. The ones we were that didn't even make the... close to the list. It was never even a dot. We yeah, we attempted to basically say that that was never going to happen. We weren't considering, it. but we were looking at you know Umbraco, Sitefinity, Kubu. Yeah, the only other big open source one at the time was Kubu, which I don't think ever really got anywhere. Yeah. If you we were, heard of that, it was like yeah. we were looking for one that was built on on MVC. Um, Umbraco at the time was working, but it was still in uh, alpha for uh, version five that was supposed to be uh, all MVC. We were a little bit skittish about their timelines. Um, yeah, and then it turned out that they never uh, launched. It was kind of vaporware. Um, and uh, Kubu was uh, the, uh, the other MVC uh, CMS that was out there at the time. But uh, we had some really specific requirements as far as environment went um, that it, there was kind of an impedance mismatch there. So we don't actually expose the Orchard admin to the public. Um, we have a separate controller server that's only available within our internal network. And we kind of block the entire admin um, from even being accessed um, from the public site. Um, and that was really important um, to the, the business that we'd be able to do that. Um, and like Kubu, that was kind of the big thing that, that it didn't do was their admin functionality was spread out all over the place. And there was no good way to just say, we're going to disable this uh, at uh, Anywhere um, in particular. So. Well, there was conversation around not doing the controller server, but we were talking about like two factor. We were going to have to enter, do like a two factor authentication <clears throat> widget or module for the admin area to call you or something if you wanted to get, if it was public, because Pager. obviously it's a major security concern. So I still have the mic, sorry. Um, about the performance, uh, most of the issues were in your code or in, or in Orchard code? It was a combination. Um, and in 1.8? What's that? And in 1.8? One what? No, we have. So just your code. Yeah. What? <laughs> Can you say that? I'm sorry. Can you say that? Just my code. It was just our code. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, right, we're, we're gonna get stiffed out of there. Yeah. I mean, we in the previous versions, the main thing was obviously a. Ton, we've had some SQL stuff. I, at one point, we actually had to create like a view that there was one SQL query that actually hit a bug in SQL 2008 that. It reaches amount of a limit that that simple one can happen. It was like a one millisecond query, but if you do it 30,000 times in five seconds, SQL query is not a fan of it. So we did do some indexing and performance specifically around that, but that's kind of we tell our DB admins yeah. look at it. And so we tuned it all at the SQL level. Uh, and one eight x should be even faster. Yeah. Try that. Well, um, yeah, it is. It is significant. Our our DB admins are extremely impressed when I said. How we look, and they're like, this is like drastically different. So, uh, last question: Why no more implication in the community? We have never heard about you, yeah. from you. So, no yeah. meetings, I mean, no modules. One of the major challenges, obviously, with us working in an enterprise is AMC. We are actually the only group that even utilizes anything open source. We're always more, and so. It's been a challenge for us to kind of convince our partners, the people who pay the bills, that the thing they pay us to do, we're just going to give to people, and that it's not just their property. So, so we are we're getting there. Like, like yeah. So, like Adam mentioned, so we're we are headways we're making headways in that. Change. We actually, but there's nothing on it. But we actually convinced them that you know we're we're going to set up an AMC Theaters GitHub account. We viewed this as an opportunity to kind of be like. We know we haven't been too much in it, but we are we were making headway in our organization in terms of our ability to finally get to a point where we can start releasing things that we put a lot of work into that we think can help the community at large. And our, so. Another thing we're gonna uh, it's, it's actually out on GitHub under my personal account right now, but um, we'll release to the NuGet uh, package stuff is. We're upgrading to the async services stuff, and so we've built out a fluent HTTP um, uh, uh, library to, to help in that regard, handles HTTP caching in a way that, um, and how calls, which was a uh, challenge with our uh, existing code. So. You make me feel guilty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you guys, um, does your admin expose like features to manage like orders and customers? Or do you guys do that through a different service? Like so when people buy, like if they want to cancel, if they want to like 
Is that managed through the orchard? That's or? actually a yeah. separate um, okay. portal application that's specific to the e-commerce uh, stuff. And it's, it's, it's talking directly to um, the order APIs um, that we okay. fix. And it's got separate security and it's more locked down in okay. different ways, different users and stuff. It uses Bootstrap. Yeah, it does. Yeah. You want to switch to Bootstrap <laughs> and Angular. Other questions? Thank you guys very much for coming.